This is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. I have another exciting garden episode for you, and here we are in suburbia. And this is suburbia, you can see all my neighbors, they have a nice lawn in their front yard. But I decided to do something different and grow some food and something productive with my front yard instead of just a lawn. A lawn can waste lots of resources, including pesticides, herbicides, and chemicals and fertilizers that just basically get run off into the gutters, which then goes into the creeks, which then pollutes our environment. So instead of having a lawn that's mostly ornamental and most people don't even use their lawns, I mean, I rarely see any of my neighbor's kids playing on their lawns. They're usually playing in the street, hitting their balls, and they're hitting my cars. But uh, in my front yard, I decided to grow a lot of food. And today what I'm going to show you is how much food you could actually grow in your front yard. Now we are here in mid-February. This is my mid-February garden update to show you that you can even grow throughout the winter here in Northern California. So uh, we're just gonna take you by uh, one bed at a time and kind of explain what I'm growing and just some cool facts and information along the way. So uh, come along with me and let's check it out. So this first bed here, we have uh, lots of things growing. On the outside, you can see we have all these flowers. Now some flowers are not only ornamental such as these, they're also edible. So this is a viola, and I love to eat the viola flowers. You can put these on salads, on top of pies or cakes, but don't cook them, they're gonna mess them up. Uh, you know, whatever you're gonna make, make it, and then put the flowers on last. It's gonna look really nice. Mm. In addition, this is like, uh, basically, we have uh, kale, uh, collards, broccoli, um, red Russian kale grown in here as the top story or above everything else and then closer to the ground we have a lot of spinach that's self-seeded and you know this is the best spinach ever the uh, food that you grow at your house you control everything that goes in your soil hopefully you're growing in rich uh, compost and rock dust and other nutrients they're going to add the nutrition and the trace minerals back in the plants and when the plants have the trace minerals they need they're not only going to flourish be healthier but when you eat them, you're going to be healthier. And the side benefit is that they're going to taste really good. Mmm. Never tasted any spinach better than that one. In addition in this bed, what we didn't plan uh, was this guy right here. This is actually called a chickweed. And here's another one that's flowering. These ones are just kind of coming up literally as weeds. Uh, for many farmers, these are actually grown as weeds. Although I did see it selling at the farmer's market today. Uh, for six dollars a pound <laughs> so you could buy it at the farmers market six dollars a pound or you could just let them grow in your garden and these things come up as weeds and we like to just take them and uh, juice them so we've been juicing a lot of these lately but they're also good for eating them mm. another thing we have coming up in this front bed that's kind of overtaking the spinach here fast grower is the miner's lettuce so this is coming up so quick and usually miner's lettuce it looks like a lily pad but what's really good even beyond that is the uh the miner's lettuce sprouts which is what i'd consider these guys and once again these were also for sale at the farmer's market six bucks a pound so six bucks a pound or literally all you have to do for the, this stuff is sprinkle out the seeds and let nature do the work these guys grow as weeds actually and wild up in the hills you know mm. really delicious flavor especially when they're young and I think I'm just gonna clear cut a lot of this stuff because it's blocking out my spinach. I'm gonna show you guys how to harvest the miner's lettuce. You know, if you have a lot of it growing, you don't have to be so careful about each individual plant. Of course, you know, if I was gonna harvest this kind of uh, collard greens here, I wouldn't just pull the plant up and eat it. But with the miner's lettuce, because it does grow in abundance, I'm not really even that careful. So you can see here, we just have a whole air of it here. I'm just gonna go in and just grab a whole bunch, and uproot it, and I will uh, pick off all the dirt there. And I got a whole bunch here, pretty much the roots there that we could uh, compost and then just mow in. Mm -hmm. Caveman style. Mm -hmm. So in another front bed right over here, and these beds are about four feet wide and 15 feet long, these guys that I'm uh, standing in front of. We have a lot of uh, more greens growing. So we've got things like arugula, mustard greens, more lettuce, some chard, uh, more chickweed. And here's just literally a big, huge bush of arugula. This is, I don't even know, a couple plants here. And you know, if you let arugula grow, normally people harvest it when it's really young. If you let it grow, it'll grow up into this nice, beautiful plant. And the uh, amazing thing about this plant are the flowers. 
and you could almost see like in the flowers you could see like the little veins where the plant juices flow and my favorite thing to do is come out here and just pick some of these aruga flowers and eat them mmm they have a nice barbecue like flavor not quite as spicy as the arugula leaves now you know you can't harvest the arugula leaves at any stage when they're young which they're probably better eaten or even when they're getting older or more mature when they're actually getting more hot and spicy I love when my plants go to flower that allows me to eat the flowers so I'm getting the pollen and also the unique colorings which is this is like a white with a red um, which are more antioxidants next let's walk in the garden to see what else is growing on so over underneath the fig tree here which is probably starting to push some buds out it's been getting kind of a little bit warmer it's got a little bit more wilds to go we got a whole understory of the miners lettuce and the miners lettuce is uh, basically reseeds on its by itself and I'll come in here and I think actually this area I just literally clip back and I'll just harvest like a whole section at a time and it just grows back mmm it's definitely a nice winter leafy green to eat that you know won't grow in the summertime and it does really well underneath the tree basically this is unmanaged it just grows pretty much wild now in addition I got some uh, chickweed which is invading the uh, miners lettuce bed that's all right because when I see it I'll eat it that'll show it over in this area once again this is the connected bed with that front bed that had the spinach as the understory we got more chard and flowers kale broccoli cauliflower all planted in this bed and the other cool thing that we have planted in this bed if you look very closely we interplanted with onions so I have three varieties of onions um, the tags are uh, getting worn out here this is the uh, heritage white onions these are top set onions so I have three varieties of top set onions that are growing in these are, are known as walking onions or uh, Egyptian onions that will basically they grow top sets they fall over and then the top sets fall over then they basically re-sprout and grow again so they just keep falling over and keep going so these are like a perennial onion uh, the funny thing is with what happened with these is that I had ordered these and I, I got a shipment in and then I I lost the shipment because I have so many things coming in from my business it was like just put out of the way I found them like literally six months after they'd been shipped and like they're kind of looking dried out and stuff and not so good and I'm like oh man this really sucks these are some really you know good quality onions that I want to plant and actually rare so I said okay let's plant them out and we planted a bunch of them and I'm happy to say that I have at least one of the three varieties so that was one variety uh, over here we have another one this variety is coming up too this one's called uh, this is actually the Egyptian walking onion there and then over here we have the uh, Katowice onions so once again these are some more tops and onions that I have coming up and right there I always encourage you to grow things that are going to be self perpetual whenever possible like the miners lettuce there and hopefully the tops and onions will be soon and actually all the spinach in the front bed that didn't even I didn't even plant that stuff it all came back so uh, some things I'll let go to seed drop seed and just you know let it keep coming back and if I had a lot of land to do this I would just have areas that would be dedicated to you know uh, growing the same thing year after year and letting the plants do all the work and reproduce drop seeds and then just come up whenever they want to in my second raised bed we put up uh, some trellises and we're growing some sugar snap peas up the trellis and uh, what we did was on because these trellises are not made for sugar snap peas and have a wide spacing we basically put a bamboo stake or an upright on every uh, sugar snap pea so it could climb up the pole and grow tall and pretty soon we'll actually be harvesting them in addition in this bed because it is so late it's February and just in a few months we're gonna be planting out for the summer we put some fast turn crops in what are fast turn crops well fast turn crops to me are crops that you could plant and they'll be done within 30 or 60 days so all the crops in here are Asian greens and uh, let's see we got some pak choy some a Mizuna and some actually red bok choy and different things like that and these guys grow really fast they'll grow fast and because of the weather's been nice 
it'll probably start to flower fast so you want to let them grow harvest them and then pull them out and then now we'll have this bed available uh, for planting as soon as two months from now but meanwhile we're producing a lot of food in this one raised bed this raised bed has some things that were growing from last summer uh, i think we got some cauliflower uh, in here or other kinds of uh, brassicas including collard greens and uh, on the understory down below it, we planted some lettuce in the shade and uh, along the outside edge we have parsley that's been growing since last year on the other side of the big uh, trellis here which we were supposed to plant some sugar snap peas that didn't quite happen yet we got the celery uh, the root celery that's been growing beautifully. I'll have an upcoming episode harvesting some of the root celery that's now ready to be harvested. Uh, we come out here and we do pick the celery stalks for juicing. This is actually some really good celery, although this celery is not meant for eating. It's meant for the root, the greens, and the celery stalks are actually really flavorful and delicious. On the outside, once again, we have more parsley growing. So while some people consider parsley an herb, I consider it a leafy green. And I'll just come out here and pick a bowl of parsley put some dressing on it and eat it as a salad. It's so delicious. Bed right behind me here. This is the bed that had a full bed of strawberries uh, last year. And uh, you know, that just really didn't work for me too much. I found that the strawberries got a lot of problems with bugs. It didn't really yield a lot for the space that it was in. And I'd rather grow something else. So if I had a ton of acreage, I'd probably grow more strawberries, but in a small raised bed situation, I'm not really gonna waste the room on strawberries. I'd rather you know, grow something like lettuce or something else next year. So we've been slowly but surely condensing the strawberries as they don't make it. And we got them down to like a quarter of the bed. And the rest of the bed here is gonna be more productive and we literally have this thing full of all kinds of lettuce. So uh, pretty soon we'll be harvesting tons of lettuce. We did plant this out in different stages. We planted these guys first and as you can see, they're getting larger first. This next bed here is pretty good. This guy, this is uh, the bok choy planted probably late summer. And it's been growing through the winter time. And uh, these guys are actually bolting now. You can see the uh, bok choy bolts. You might be saying, hey John, that looks just like broccoli. Well, broccoli and bok choy are in the same family of plants, the brassica family. And you know, this is what will happen to the bok choy. It makes the flowers. And that's what broccoli is. Broccoli is just basically the undeveloped or unopened flower of the broccoli plant in this case you know this is the bok choy plants well don't just think that my bok choy is flowering i gotta pull it out no guess what you want to do you want to go around here and as i see them i go around here and i break off all the flowering tops and we could cut these up and use them in salads or juice them mm. or just eat them straight they amazingly taste like broccoli for some reason also in this raised bed we put some uh, t posts and some galvanized fencing wire and you can see here we have the uh, sugar snap peas uh, binding up the middle, and that's growing really well. On this back side, we have uh, lots of things growing. Once again, we put another row of the bok choy. So this is a baby bok choy uh, growing, not quite as mature as the old stuff. Now, if your uh, bok choy and your greens are more tender and smaller, I would prefer to eat them for salads. So always you want to pick the smaller greens for salads. If you do get bok choys that are getting larger, you can still eat them for salads, although I prefer to eat the small stuff. But as the leaves get larger, they also get more fibrous, more tough, and usually more flavorful. So in the case of bok choy and other brassicas, the taste can't get a lot stronger. So in that case, what I like to do with the larger leaves is usually blend them up, juice them, or if you are into cooking, you could definitely cook them up as well. On this side, we have a mixture, a lot of uh, fast-turned mustard greens. And actually even some beets. I see a beet here. And uh, these guys, once again, are some kind of uh, Asian green. And these guys are flowering as well. And once again, just like that bok choy I just showed you, you could see here, this looks like a broccoli, but not quite as tight of a head. And it also has got the flowers. So just the other day, I was coming out here and just picking all these tops off. And all these tops basically went in to dress up my salad and also gave me some nice yellow color and also all the pollen that's in there. And pollen is high in protein. So this next bed, which we have our trellis system on, where I usually grow cucumbers every summer, which I'm probably not going to grow them here this summer, uh, we direct seeded some things in different areas. So in this area, we uh, direct seeded some uh, radishes. And uh, actually, look at this. Here's a cute little radish here. 
These are almost getting ready. I think these are some kind of a breakfast radish. They're uh, red or pink on the bottom and white on the top. And uh, you know, there's no better radish than a radish that you fresh dug. Wow. And you can't get them this young in the store. We did plant these a little bit close together. So now I have the joy of coming out here and just thinning them out and uh, eating all of them. Now while most people do eat the radishes, don't forget you can also consume the tops. So the radish greens, they're also edible. They can be a bit strong. And they got some hairs on them. They kind of taste like the radishes but stronger. So I like to blend these up or juice them up or also you could cook them up if you choose. On the front here we have some watermelon radishes. And then we have uh, different kinds of radishes. This is the uh, French breakfast radish that I just pulled. And then some other ones I can't quite read the tag on. <laughs> and we'll go back to the back here where there looks to be another pretty good radish. Let's go ahead and pull that one up. Now these guys are still a bit young to be harvested, but this looks like a little uh, white radish. And uh, we're gonna see how that one tastes. Mmm, that had a good flavor actually. Radishes can be hot and spicy. I usually like to pickle my radishes or just eat them fresh. I think I do have a video where I spiralize some radishes to make a radish salad out of them. And once again, don't forget about the greens. Now, if you are new into gardening, the one thing I would encourage you to grow are radishes. Why? Radishes are one of the easiest things to grow. They'll be up and done in no time. And you're going to be a success with growing radishes. And once you got one success under your belt, keep adding more successes under your belt so that you can soon enough grow as much as I am. Next area was an area that didn't quite work out so well. This area was planted out along at the same time with all the other areas. And we planted many different varieties of carrots, which, were, which are slow to germinate. But also we have some problems with some slugs right now. So this area is uh, pretty pretty empty at this point. You know what, in gardening and in life, it's all a learning experience. You know, you're gonna do things in life and sometimes you're gonna do good, sometimes you're not. And in gardening too, you're gonna learn. So hey, maybe next time I won't plant carrots because they don't really work and I'll plant more radishes. And over in this area, we got one of the things that I love so much. This is called mosh or corn salad. A lot of the corn salad over in this area uh, self-seeded and reseeded itself came back on its own this stuff basically has the tenderness of like a baby lettuce and it's just kind of like has a little oily texture mmm only grows in the winter time here won't grow in the summertime and uh, we even reseeded it right here you can see here I have an I think I had an episode where I actually bought the seeds for these guys that we did reseed the seeds were purchased from the uh, the seed bank or rareseeds.com but on the mache, I love it so much, it's so delicious, but it is a little bit of a pain in the butt to harvest a significant amount of it. But it's definitely worth it. Next over in this area, we got another root crop, and these are turnips. I think we planted mostly a high curie turnips. Nowhere near being ready to eat yet. But uh, these guys are actually grown. The high, But these guys, the high curie turnips, are grown for the white the turnip, which is actually quite good, but also the greens are probably a delicacy to see somewhere in the world. And so I like to eat those and also uh, juice them up as well. And this area is another seed that I planted uh, from the seed bank and I bought these in bulk. And this is actually uh, like some pepper cress. And uh, this thing just comes up like pepper cress sprouts. I'll come out here with a knife or scissors and just cut off sections of it. So you can see I harvested this area over in here just the other day. This is like a breakfast one day. A breakfast smoothie and uh, it just grows really nice and once again pepper cress is another uh, thing you can grow that grows really easily that's gonna yield a lot and you're gonna be really successful at it but you know you want to harvest it when it's young when it's a little bit more tender so if I want to come and harvest it I could just come in I'll hold the bottom bottom of the plant there so I don't want to uproot it and then I'll just come to the top and tear it out now it's of course better to do this with a scissors or a knife but you can easily see we got a handful of uh, sprouts. Mmm. Nothing better than fresh pit greens out of your garden. So in my last raised bed here, we have a whole bunch of tree collared trees, and these things grow really large. And uh, this is the same bed that I put some um, worm castings in. 
and it looks like actually I have very few aphid or whitefly problems like I had previously so maybe those castings worked down below it here you can see we have a whole bunch of plant starts we've been propagating the tree collards and also some walking stick kale over yonder this bed used to be my herb bed and uh, you got all overgrown so we pull it all out and start it over so we plant a lot of greens in here for the winter time we got things like lettuce and spinach and uh, we got some cilantro over on that side and we even planted some wild arugula so this wild arugula here is different than the standard arugula although the taste is very similar uh, this guy is purported to be a perennial uh, in our climate here but I haven't found that to be the case yet I did experiment with this a few years ago and it wasn't quite a perennial but I have a bunch of plants here and we're gonna see if uh, we can keep it perennial basically they say once it goes to uh, flower you want to just keep clipping it back and it should just continue to grow and uh, so we'll see what happens uh, next over in this bed we have some herbs planted we got the Rao Ram the Ha or the I think that's the uh, Chinese chives and the cilantro we also have some dill here and of course the upper story here which isn't quite happy with the cold weather is the lemon verbena uh, in a more mild climate this would easily grow year-round of course behind me which is the garage wall we have some grapevines that need to really get pruned back over in this bed we have the lychee tomato which has not made it because of the weather although um, we got all the dried berries on there that have the seeds so we still need to harvest the seeds from those and I'll probably be offering the seeds of those really soon down below once again we've been uh, propagating some of the tree collards and more of the uh, walking stick uh, kale or Jersey kale also known as Jersey cabbage uh, next let's go ahead and look at the four foot by 40 foot long bed on the side of the property so in this long bed we have some fruit trees I think I planted them every six feet we got two fahoa trees we got a pomegranate a fig and then even a sweet gomi tree and also a tea tree but also along the bottom we're growing different things and once again here is the uh, infamous chickweed so this is the chickweed that actually we've been harvesting to just juice like massive quantities and it keeps growing back really fast it actually makes a really nice juice nice and mild over in this area, once again, more greens. I think we got some uh, cauliflower and whatnot growing. And here is a lychee tomato that did survive the cold weather. Now, why would one survive here and the other one on the other side of the yard, maybe like 30 feet away, not make it? It's very simple. Over in this side of the yard, we have a nice tree and the tree acts as a protection for the lychee tomato so it doesn't get too cold. So this one didn't defoliate and you could even see there are still even some fruits on here that are ripening up and that's why I like the lychee tomato because it is a bit more frost tolerant although you know if you get too cold it won't make it but in a protected area this thing will probably continue to ripen the fruits and continue to grow although I haven't seen any flowers on it lately back in this area uh, you can see here we this is the sweet gomi tree so uh, maybe that's how they got gummy bears from the sweet gummy makes these small little fruits that I've never had any yet off my trees but I have had them before and they actually were quite good when it does produce if it does produce it's gonna produce in such mass like all these little small little fruits so I'm waiting for it and because the weather's been so nice you can see it's actually starting to flower here it's starting to bud and flower and there's probably one of the first flowers opening up on my sweet gummy right behind it here we got these guys growing. This is the uh, purple uh, tree mallow. And these have beautiful purple flowers that I love to eat. And also the leaves are all edible on here. One of the problems with the purple tree mallow that we've been having are the rust. And what that looks like is this. And here's one that's stricken with rust. So the rust is a disease that affects the mallow and you can see it just makes these like little boils on the bottom and all these little spots so that's the that's a bad leaf now when I do see rust I usually just go and I'll just pick all the leaves that have afflicted with rust off the plant because uh, this will spread to the unaffected leaves of course here's a nice leaf that doesn't have the rust on it and uh, you know the ones that are near the growth tips those are the ones that I'm usually harvesting and eating not the ones with the rust 
So in addition in this bed, what we have is uh, in this area, we have the uh, bronze fennel. I have a really good episode on the bronze fennel. It's describing it and its growth habits and all that stuff. But in addition, because it was so large, dropped a lot of seeds, we have something else that came up on its own. And that's right down here. If you look very carefully amongst the violas, you could see maybe on the camera, there's all these little things sprouting up. And these are all baby fennel plants. And so this can probably be a nuisance. But what I like to do is I like to come down to the baby fennel plants and I'll just uh, pull them up. And uh, guess what these are? These are what I call micro greens because they're greens and they're micro. <laughs> and you can eat them. And they have a mild like licorice flavor. They're so delicate I would have never tasted these if I didn't grow bronze fennel because I just wouldn't sprout them and eat them. But when you have so many things just growing in mass abundance, you have the opportunity to try new things and like baby plants that you wouldn't normally eat. In addition, we definitely planted plenty of them up in pots so I have more bronze fennel plants that I know what to do with. Another plant that's been surviving throughout the winter in a pot, once again, this is in a protected area, are these younger lychee tomatoes. And you can see these guys are actually uh, setting the flower buds and probably gonna be flowering soon. So these guys were unaffected by, you know, some of the colder weather that took out that other larger plant. Probably my pride and joy, and it's also the slugs and snails pride and joy at night when they're out eating it, are my uh, sugar snap peas. But some of the slugs and snails have devastated, but I came out here and got some revenge last night. Now the slugs come out at night, oh yeah. So the slugs come out at night and all come out at night to literally hunt them and uh, take care of them where they're at outside. And you know, once again, manual control is one of the easy controls. I don't like to lay down slug bait or anything like that. You could make beer traps or something, but picking them off is the surefire method that definitely works. But the reason why this is my pride and joy is because uh, the first uh, sugar snap pea pot of the year is right here. And uh, I'm going to pick it for you guys. So uh, this is currently mid-February and uh, mid-February I'm eating fresh sugar snap peas. Mmm, man, that is so sweet and so delicious. Pretty soon I'll have another crop coming in over where we planted a whole bunch more of these guys in the regular raised bed. On this area, which is the side of the house, we got a nice uh, large uh, trellis here. And I formerly grew the chalte squash vines up here, and it grew pretty well. But I want to grow something here that would basically grow year-round and keep its green greenness and fill in the wall, because I don't think the wall looks that nice. And uh, so what we planted down here are these guys, and these are some uh, special passion fruit vines. You can see they've been doing uh, fairly well, and we've uh, basically... Uh, trellising them up the trellis and even though it has been a little bit cold this winter time they got their greens and they're still growing so this is one of the most uh, frost tolerant passion fruit varieties that actually fruits and makes an edible fruit but at last I don't know the name <laughs> but I did get it from the California rare fruit growers plant sale uh, and once again you know this is just over my uh, gas meter and uh, down below the gas meter, we have these guys planted, which are the uh, Bloody Dock or Red Vein Sorrel, which, once again, are best to eat in their young baby state like they are now. So we're going to finish up here in the herb bed. And in this little bed here, which is literally about a foot by maybe about 10 feet long, growing lots of cilantro. Cilantro is filled in really nice. This is a shady spot, but because it's shady and next to the house, that also means it's more protected from the cold. So it's not getting too cold here, but it's not getting too much sun either. But this cilantro seems to do really well in the winter time here. Uh, the last thing I want to share with you guys is, is this guy right here, which is planted a little bit too deep, which is the uh, rock lettuce. So this is a special plant. It's called rock lettuce, and this is a perennial edible vegetable, and uh, it grows basically in the crevices and cracks of like uh, cliffs by the ocean. And uh, it's also edible. So I started growing it and actually, you know, it's fairly tolerant to drought so far and, uh, you know, growing really well. And let me tell you, man, when I eat this stuff, mmm, man, I was like, this is probably one of the best flavors in my whole garden right now. So maybe later today, I'll even pick up some more rock lettuce plants to plant. For those of you that are interested, this is the uh, tag for the rock lettuce. It's called Cretan Rock Lettuce Petromarula. Pinata. And I always like to leave the tags in the soil so I know what the plants are.
So I would encourage you to check out the rock lettuce and grow it in your area. It can be difficult to find the starter plants, and I don't know if it's propagated by seeds or not. How about the baby plant? But nonetheless, the rock lettuce and everything else I'm growing in my garden is raised without chemicals, and all the stuff tastes really good. And I'm so glad that I'm able to grow all this and also share this with you guys and hopefully inspire you guys to grow food in your front yard, backyard, and beyond. Hopefully you've enjoyed this episode just with a little tour of my front yard garden. I'll be sure to have upcoming episodes teaching all kinds of aspects of gardening uh, no matter what I'm doing. Usually I just my gardening show is just filming my daily life and just an aspect of what I'm doing in my life for gardening and growing more food and eating a healthy diet and spreading the message to others. Once again, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time and keep on growing.